everyone. I'm Justin Masson. I'm here from uh, Shimadzu Scientific Instruments. Uh, we're going to talk about EDX today. Just give you a brief overview of what Shimadzu is. We're a, we're a global corporation. We've been around for 140 years, uh, established in 1875 in Japan. Um, we're ranked top five instrument providers in the world by Chemical Engineering News, so we uh, have pretty broad business. Um, we offer an extremely broad range of products or solutions as we like to call them. And I'll just list a few here. All different types of chromatographs, spectrometers, uh, we can do environmental analysis. Here's what more people will be here would be interested in a lot of physical measurement devices, uh, x-ray devices, balances of scales, and so forth. So we have a, a pretty broad line. Um, show of hands, who here is familiar with XRF, X-ray fluorescence? Couple. Okay, a handful. Um, XRF is an analytical method to determine the elemental composition of many types of materials. And I bold it elemental because people always ask the question, well, can it tell me about bonding or molecular information? It cannot. Uh, X-ray fluorescence deals with the manipulation of the inner shell electrons, so we can't determine oxidation state. We cannot determine bonding. Purely elemental information. Um, can be also be used to determine the thickness and composition of layers, coatings, and plating. So if you have a, uh, a plating sample, we can determine the thickness of that plating, what the composition is. Um, a common, if we had an EDX here, a common little demonstration I would do is to determine the uh, uh, copper plating thickness of a penny. It's copper over zinc. It's a pretty uh, easy or fundamental way to, to um, as an example of that type of analysis. Um, also, it's fast, accurate, and non-destructive. This is one of the biggest benefits of using EDX. Uh, it's non-destructive, so you take your sample, you don't have to, if you're doing elemental analysis, traditionally it's done by uh, AA, ICP, ICPMS, you have to get your sample into solution. Um, that could take a significant amount of time, cost a lot of money. With EDX, it's non-destructive, so you just take your sample and put it in a device and hit go. Uh, requires minimal sample prep. Um, samples can be in solid, liquid, powder, or filtered form. Uh, so solid meaning you could take your sample and just stick it in there. Uh, liquid, you could put it in an XRF cup. Powder, you could also put it in an XRF cup or you can press it. Uh, there are different reasons why you'd want to do one or the other. And filtered, you could, if you have a liquid solution, you could deposit it on a filter paper, wait for it to evaporate, and then measure it in EDX. So what is EDX? Uh, EDX or F stands for energy, energy dispersive X-ray fluorescence. Uh, energy dispersive means we could discern the energies of X-rays. Uh, X-rays is a form of energy. In this case, it's our ionizing, ionizing radiation. And fluorescence is the phenomenon of absorbing energy and then subsequently releasing energy. This is a very basic diagram of an EDX. We have an X-ray source. This is our sample. Uh, we have radiating x-rays that hit the sample, generating fluorescent x-rays, which are then detected, um, goes through a preamp and digital pulse processor, and then on our PC, we actually see the, uh, the spectrum and get the quantitation results. Uh, very briefly, what are x-rays? They're, they're a kind of electromagnetic energy. This right here is the electromagnetic spectrum, so they're in between gamma rays and UV rays. Uh, Wavelength between 0.01 to 10 nanometers, and the energy of that is 0.125 to 125 keV, uh, roughly. Also, two different terms for x-rays. Hard x-rays are greater than 10 keV, and soft x-rays are less than 10 keV. So how do x-rays interact with matter? Um, when x-rays strike matter, some are absorbed, some pass through, some are scattered. Uh, Absorption and penetration depth depend on elemental composition, density, and the thickness of the matter, and I've got some more slides on that because we always get questions on that. Uh, but the most important or the most applicable uh, interaction is that secondary x-rays are generated. Uh, these fluorescent x-rays which are characteristic of that matter. So that's what allows us to take this unknown sample right here, stick it in this instrument, and have the PC tell us, oh, if that's iron at this concentration. So there are all different ways x-rays can interact with matter. Uh, x-ray diffraction deals with Rayleigh and Compton scattering. Uh, they can be transmitted. That's like when you go to the doctor and get an x-ray. Uh, or they can interact with the uh, valence electrons, and that's where we get XPS. Uh, but we're concerned with x-ray fluorescence. And again, that's when we absorb energy and then subsequently release energy. Um, 
Additionally, had a uh, degree of fluorescence, as I said earlier, depends on the, really the, the composition of the, th of the sample. So the th thickness of the sample, the density, what it's made of. Um, roughly penetration depth. Uh, the source on the Shibazu EDX 7000, it's a rhodium x-ray tube. So for a rhodium K-alpha x-ray, the energy is around 20 keV. Uh, penetration depth in lead is pretty shallow, 25 microns about but up through water it can get to three centimeters. So it really depends on density and composition of the sample. Um, how do x-rays interact with atoms? First we need an atom. <laughs> is, then we'll take our radiating x-ray, which ejects an inner shell electron. Now we have a vacant hole here and we need to fill that, so electron from a higher energy shell falls down, releases energy, releases a fluorescent x-ray. Uh, this right here is what we measure. Now this fluorescent x-ray has a discrete energy and it's indicative of that sample material. So this, this x-ray, um, I, so I think I've got an example on another slide of, of what it is, but our detector measures the energy of this x-ray and from that energy we can know what the transition of what, uh, what specific transition of which element that is. So different types of transitions, um, they're labeled K, L, or M. Uh, depending on the final resting place of the electron. So if we have a transition that happens from a higher shell to the K shell, that transition starts at the K and then alpha, beta, gamma, those uh, are indicative of where the electron came from. So when you look at a spectrum, you'll see uh, say iron K alpha. That means we know that an electron from the K shell was ejected, an electron from the L shell fell down uh, to fill that hole and released a K alpha ray. Um, ratios of K alpha to K beta, beta rays are fixed, so uh, some of the algorithms in the software use that ratio um, for overlap correction and uh, matrix correction, things like that. Um, these are called characteristic x-rays. Um, as an example, um, this is an iron atom, so we have a K alpha transition here. And as I said earlier, this is a very, this is, it has a discrete energy. It's indicative of this transition of this element. So just as an example, we can do our, uh, some mathematics here. E equals uh, H nu or, H t or Planck's constant times the speed of light over the wavelength. We fill that in. We get about that 6.40 keV. Uh, you can check that if you want. <laughs> we then take a look at an energy table, and this is one that we put out, but you've, if you just Googled, uh, X, XRF transition energies, you know, whatever, you'll find charts like this all over the web. So we look at uh, iron and the K alpha transition, and that's given on the table at 6.400 keV. As you can see, there's nothing really around it. Manganese at 5.895 and cobalt at 6.925. So this 6.400 keV energy is very indicative uh, of an iron K alpha transition. So we know that it's iron. Um, this is what a typical spectrum would look like. The y-axis is in terms of counts per second per microamp. Uh, the voltage and, and current of the x-ray tube um, can be adjusted depending on what your sample is, what you're trying to excite. Uh, so if you increase the current, you're gonna you know, increase the uh, intensity of the signal as well. So that's why it's counts per second per microamp. The x-axis, keV, this goes from zero to 40 keV. And this right here is where a peak is labeled. This is calcium K alpha. Um, this is what a data output screen looks like. Uh, as just an example, we have a list of elements here, concentrations, uh, types of analysis, type of analysis. This is, uh, FP stands for fundamental parameters, which is standard list measurement. So fundamental parameters um, uses the fundamental physical parameters uh, to, correlate intensity versus concentration. Um, you can also create a calibration curve that'd be a more accurate way. FP can vary by about 20% uh, depending on what your sample type is. Um, balance just, so this instrument cannot see carbon. However, I think this was a, I forget, this might've been like a organic sample and I just, set it as a balance so that the concentrations would be more indicative of what was actually in there. If I didn't have carbon as a balance, then all these 
concentration percentages would be skewed because it would want to total to 100%. Um, let's see. This is the analytical range of the two EDXs we offer, 7,000 and 8,000. Um, 10 years ago, EDX wasn't that popular in a research lab because the sensitivities just weren't there. Uh, they're primarily used by geologists to qualitatively determine what was in your sample, but as the detection methods got better, our you know, uh, use of this technology has expanded greatly. So you can see uh, some of these heavy metals, these high Z elements, we can get down to about 100 ppb concentration, which is pretty good when you don't have to get something into solution or you know, digest it. Yeah. This is the basics of an EDX system. This is the EDX 7000, but it's similar to most EDXs in the market. You have an X-ray tube right here. In our case, it's a rhodium tube. Um, filters, filters are a way of just conditioning the X-ray beam. Uh, collimators will help you limit the irradiation area of a sample, and you use that in conjunction with a, a camera. In this instrument, it's a CMOS camera. But uh, collimators come between, uh, one, three, five, and 10 millimeter collimators. So if you wanted to irradiate just a small part of your sample, you can use the collimator in conjunction with the camera to position it and just irradiate that small section of the, the sample you need. And then the uh, x-rays are detected. In, this, in the EDX 7000, 8000, it's a silicon drift detector. Um, other type of detectors are silly detectors or silicon pin diode detectors. And they all have their pros and cons. Um, the sample is irradiated from the bottom, so we don't have to account for sample height. Uh, this is an image of the Shimazu EDX 7000 slash 8000 right here. So it's very small, it's bench top, it weighs less than 100 pounds. Uh, this is the analysis area right here. So it's a pretty large chamber which can handle you know, a, a big bulk sample if need be. Um, why use EDX? Uh, I said earlier, elemental analysis traditionally done by AAICP. Um, that requires sample prep, sample digestion, uh, cost analysis is high, you've got lots of consumables. Uh, some of those instruments require really highly, highly trained analysts. Um, with EDX, most importantly, there's no sample prep. Uh, so you don't have to change your sample or uh, alter your sample in any way to get the instrument to analyze it. Um, detection limits are pretty high for heavy elements, less than one ppm, which is, is high when you don't have to uh, digest your sample, get it in solution and thus dilute it. Uh, extremely low cost of analysis uh, in terms of both time and money. So there's no gas requirements, no exhaust, no sample waste, uses less bench space. Uh, it's easy to use, so you don't need to have a highly trained analyst to run it. Um, uh, no consumables other than the x-ray tube and detector, which last three years, five years, 10 years, depending on how often and how roughly it's used. Um, just some examples of all the applications that we have right now. Uh, ceramics, mining, it's all, it's all elemental analysis. Um, this one's probably most relevant. Thin film analysis for semiconductor disks, liquid crystals, and solar cells. Um, but there's all different, all different industries that use this instrument or use this type of technology. I've got a couple of applications here highlighted. Um, foreign matter identification. Again, this is making use of the collimator and sample camera. So what we're doing here is we have this, uh, looks like a, a plastic, plastic sample right here with this unknown um, foreign matter right here. Uh, so what we can do is measure this area, which is the blue line, what we're calling the clean area, measure the red area, uh, which is the um, contaminant. And as you can see here, uh, it's probably stainless steel. Um, we can overlay the spectra and see what's different. We could subtract out the clean area, treat that as a blank. Um, and one of the uh, beneficial features of our software is this matching library. So there are libraries included, but you could also make your own, uh, own libraries. So right here we have this we have our unknown sample and we want to see what it is. Um, turns out to be, we could go through, put it through our matching system. It's a, uh, SUS is a Japanese designation for stainless steel. So it gives you uh, a difference factor 
So most likely this is uh, stainless 316. And again, you can make your own libraries for whatever you need. Another, another, another example, um, hazardous substances and products. Uh, this is more in line with ROAST analysis. ROAST is R-O-H-S, which is a European restriction of hazardous substances for these elements down here. Um, so as you can see, we use uh, standard samples. This is a polyethylene resin with these standards in there. Um, and these spectra are the, the plastic base material, then the scrape paint, and then the paint plus plastic base material. Um, this type of application is usually used in a manufacturing plant just for screening. Uh, they'll pull a product off and, uh, the assembly line, stick it in there, whatever. Um, thin films. So right here we have a uh, copper substrate with nickel, phosphorus, and lead plated on there. Um, so what we did here was simultaneously analyze the um, plating thickness and the composition of the of this film. Uh, we set the base element to 100%. You could fix the concentrations if need be. Um, all, you can have up to, in our software, up to nine layers. So it's not just one, one layer, up to nine layers. Um, here's another application example. Quanti uh, qualitative analysis of uh, cement. I should say quantitative, actually, not qualitative. Um, good thing about cement is that you get plenty of standards from NIST. So we used these standards from NIST to create a calibration curve. First, we, we press the sample in a... Uh, 25 ton press for 60 seconds. The reason you want to use a press, uh, if you had just a powder sample and you put it in a sample cup, there's a film that goes in the cup and that could absorb some of the radiation so you lose sensitivity. So if you press it, you don't need to use uh, that film and you'll get the best sensitivity. Also, uh, if it, with a powder, if you want to analyze something under vacuum, vacuum will give higher sensitivity for lighter elements. Um, you cannot do that with a powder in a cup. Uh, you'll destroy the instrument. So if you want to do that, we would press it using a, a simple uh, hydraulic press. Just some of the calibration curves from these samples. Uh, LLDs and results. As you can see, most importantly, it's a very accurate and precise instrument. Uh, it's another question people often have is how accurate, how precise is it? because most people's experience with EDX is geology. It's just a way to qualitatively tell it's in there. But it can, uh, in the past 10, 15 years or so, um, advancements have made it very possible uh, or very applicable to a research laboratory. Another application, polymer film. So what we're doing here is we're determining the thickness and concentration of polymer films. Um, we have a new feature of our software. It's called the background FP method where it incorporates uh, X-ray scattering into the standard fundamental parameters calculation. So we use the Compton scattering to determine the thickness of a film while simultaneously determining its constituent elements. Um, very briefly talk about scattering. Uh, two types of scattered radiation, Compton scattering, Rayleigh scattering. Compton is inelastic, Rayleigh is elastic scattering. Um, this is what it looks like on a spectrum. Um, it's labeled rhodium K beta, rhodium K alpha. This is the Rayleigh scattering. And the C after that refers to Compton scattering. Um, Compton scattering is going to be much more intense in plastic samples or light element samples. Um, so you can see here, uh, this red line is lead, this green line is perspex, which is a thermoplastic polymer. So in lead, there's almost no, there's absolutely no Compton scattering, but in this polymer, we get large Compton scattering. So since the thickness and density of material, since the, well, in this application, the thickness of material um, affects the Compton scattering, we can use that Compton scattering to figure out the thickness of the sample. So you can see right here, um, these are three, the overlap spectra for these three polymer films of different thicknesses. This is the Compton scattering right here. So six micron, 12 micron, 25 micron, uh, all give different intensities for the Compton scattering. Thus we can use that to determine the thickness of a film. Um, and this is the result of the polyester film thickness measurement done by background FP. 
Um, this is the determined value. This is the reference value, or what it is. And this is what's, how it was measured by micrometer. So you can see it's a very accurate analysis tool, uh, possibly more accurate in this way. So, you know, 14.5 compared to 14, and then you know, 29.7 with a reference value of 25. And then with by micrometer, you're only getting a range of 26 to 30. Um, additionally, just another application, uh, just continuing on, this is a simultaneous determination of the film thickness and elemental composition. So pretty much the same thing, but we actually um, determined the composition of what was in this polyethylene film. Um, we'll have the slides on here if you guys want to read through this. This is just all different examples of applications we have. So these will be on the website in the presentation. Um, for more information, you can visit our website. We have a whole separate section for applications uh, and other information about EDX analysis. Um, I think we're running out of time. So why don't we just open up the questions now? <laughs>